Hello everyone, and welcome to my The Young and the Restless official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Dr. Alcott reassured Chelsea that she would be more than capable of assisting Connor if she was equipped with the necessary tools. Chelsea informed the doctor in her office that while she had great faith in therapy and treatment, she wasn't sure whether she could deal with Connor's OCD. If she hadn't already, Chelsea was still worried that she would make things far worse for her son. Chelsea revealed that she had tried suicide once, believing it to be the only way out of an agony that had grown intolerable, by standing on a building's roof and preparing to jump. Chelsea imagined that Connor was experiencing similar intrusive thoughts to her own, and the only reason she was not dead inside was because a friend had reached her in time to prevent her from jumping. Dr. Alcott guessed Chelsea had asked for assistance. Chelsea attested to the fact that she had been placed in an inpatient facility and had received therapy ever since. She's shown a tremendous deal of strength, which the doctor applauded. Even though Chelsea was happy with her development, she whined that it was overwhelming to feel as though she had given her son a terrible gene. Chelsea clarified that she didn't want to hurt Connor anymore because he was a perceptive child who sensed her emotions. Dr. Alcott emphasized that seeking therapy is still possible and that there was no blame factor. Chelsea narrated how, after years of acting out, the voices in her head had finally driven her to a precipice. Chelsea was concerned that before Connor received treatment, his self-loathing and frightening ideas would drive him over the edge. Chelsea shared Connor's admissions of these feelings. Chelsea emphasized that she wasn't attempting to draw attention to herself. Dr. Alcott surmised that Chelsea's perception of Connor as a burden could actually be an asset because of her personal mental health struggles, which made her understanding of Connor's requirements and the fact that there was no quick answer. Is the residential facility truly the greatest course of action? Chelsea questioned the doctor's assessment. Chelsea was urged to make a decision as soon as possible by the doctor, who said that Connor's treatment was essential to helping him deal with the uncomfortable sensations that led to his ritualistic habits. Chelsea sobbed as she collapsed into a chair in the waiting area after leaving the office. Connor slathered hand sanitizer all over his dorm room hands. Adam volunteered to assist in putting away the items he had brought from home, but Connor objected, saying his father wouldn't do it correctly. Adam brought up the fact that Connor had never explained his desire to switch rooms, but Connor was unwilling to discuss it. Adam speculated that Connor might not have liked the hue of the walls, or that there might have been an issue with a different kid. Connor shouted out, it was me, adding that me and my craziness were the reasons he hadn't been able to stay in his previous room. Adam emphasized that Connor was the best child ever, Thus, the term crazy was just the OCD talking. Adam returned the conversation to the room change while Connor became engrossed in organizing the books on his shelf. Adam vowed he was attempting to comprehend in order to assist Connor. Adam remembered that Connor enjoyed seven or numbers that could be divided by seven. Connor acknowledged that the room number had been the issue. Connor revealed that his previous room number was 23, and that 2 plus 3 equaled 5, which was not good. Adam said that the number 21 was his favorite, and Connor surmised that this was because Adam had a fondness for gambling in Las Vegas. Adam was taken aback and questioned who had told his son that. Connor related that Johnny had heard his parents discussing how Adam had once been a card player in Vegas. It seems like a lifetime ago, Adam said, and he questioned Connor about the retreat the doctor had recommended. Adam maintained that it was a place where people could provide Connor with the assistance he needed, despite Connor's complaints that it was a hospital for insane people. Because his parents had said they didn't have to decide yet, Connor complained. Adam explained that they were talking about it because they had agreed to do so. Connor acknowledged that his fear was the reason he didn't want to go. Adam excitedly pointed out that they could find out the room number ahead of time and pledged that he and Chelsea would try their best to make things simpler. Connor contended that he knew where everything was at home and at school, but he would be alone at the institution and wouldn't know where anything was. 
Adam had no doubts Connor would find friendship. Since Connor didn't have friends at school, he reasoned, there was no reason to think he would in the hospital. Adam promised that everything will work out. Connor sobbed, not if I have to go to that place. Adam suggested that since they were only getting started and no decisions had been taken, they observe how things worked out. Adam offered to fetch pizza for him and Connor, but Connor muttered that he wasn't hungry. Adam suggested that Connor demonstrate the proper manner for him to unpack his backpack. Adam promised that the facility could assist Connor, but Connor cried out that nothing could cure him. Connor finally lost it and declared that he didn't want to be there because he hated it and didn't want to go to the institution for crazies. Adam gave Connor the reassurance that no matter what, including the residential program, he and Chelsea would be there for him. Connor pleaded with Adam to take him home rather than forcing him to go to the location. Adam answered, absolutely, and Connor threw himself into his father's arms. Connor, Chelsea, and Adam showed up at Crimson Lights later. Adam offered Connor a brownie to persuade him, but Connor was worried that his mother could have made changes to his room and he wanted to go upstairs and make the necessary adjustments. Chelsea advised they talk about the choice they had to make, and she assured them she hadn't touched anything. Connor strode over to the patio, morose. Dr. Alcott had suggested the ERP residential program, Chelsea mentioned. Adam suggested that they discuss it later, pointing out that it had been a hard day. Connor bemoaned his wariness, but Chelsea wouldn't dismiss the matter, saying it was too significant. While Chelsea understood that Connor was worried about falling behind in his coursework, she promised to make sure he continued to stay up to date during his treatment. Chelsea understood that the idea of attending a retreat was unsettling, but she assured him that they would locate the ideal location and that things will improve while Connor quietly arranged the condiments and napkins on the table. Connor Umbrelli yelled that his father had told him not to go if he didn't want to, and he hadn't. Chelsea gave Adam a glare. Kyle had a feeling that Claire and Victoria had not told all there was to her narrative at the Abbott estate. Someone remembered that although Claire seemed to click right away with Harrison, Victoria had been circumspect in her remarks. Seeing their son's smile had been a pleasant diversion, Kyle exclaimed. Summer wished for their boy to once more feel secure. Though she wanted to conduct some study first, she was amenable to the notion of speaking with Claire. Claire might not be interested, Kyle cautioned. Summer brought up the fact that Claire had expressed interest in working with kids. Though it was worth a try, Kyle retorted, it didn't mean Claire wanted to be a nanny. Summer had plans to investigate the portions of the story that Victoria had not told them. Using her phone, she sent a message. When Nick got at the Newman property, he yelled for his parents. Nicky, Victoria, and Claire had gone to confront Jordan, Victor told Nick. Victor admitted that he had been hesitant to consent to it, and Nick thought it was a horrible idea. Victor clarified that Nikki had believed that it would enable her to recover her own power and stay sober. Victor guessed Victoria and Claire had also thought it would strengthen Jordan to know she was no longer able to harass them. They had powerful women in their family, Nick thought to himself. As Summer got to the property, she gave Nick and Victor hugs. Summer remembered seeing Victoria and Claire at Crimson Lights, and how amazing it was to her that the baby that everyone had assumed was dead was in fact still alive. Summer revealed that although Victoria didn't appear interested in learning about Claire's past, Harrison had loved her right away. What should Summer know about her new relative, Summer wondered. Nick acknowledged that Claire had an unpleasant and convoluted past. When Summer discovered that Claire had participated in a plot to assassinate the Newmans, she was shocked. Victor clarified that Claire was just as much of a victim as the rest of them, having been brought up to despise them by her aunt. Summer argued that it didn't justify Claire's behavior and questioned why Claire wasn't incarcerated. Summer discovered that Claire had been freed from the psych ward instead of the hospital when Victor disclosed that Michael had made sure Claire had been placed in a mental facility. Victor asked Summer to be understanding and take into account what Claire had been through. 
Victor insisted that they accept Claire into the family despite Summer's references to all that Claire had caused their family. Nick, Summer noted, had not said anything. Nick said that it wasn't easy for him because he couldn't forgive and forget after witnessing Nikki suffer, and Claire was one of the reasons his mother's sobriety had been ruined. For Victoria's sake, he promised to be polite and give Claire another chance, but he knew it would take some time to move over what Claire and Jordan had done to his mother. As they talked, Victor reassured them that Jordan was being taken care of. Summer came back to the Abbott estate and told Kyle that they were glad they had looked into Claire's background. Summer believed that because Claire was emotionally and mentally unstable, it would be a grave error to allow her care for Harrison or even spend time with him alone. After everything Claire had done, Summer found it hard to imagine anyone would want to welcome her into the family. Nikki, Victoria, and Claire were escorted by a bodyguard to the rundown structure housing Jordan's cell. Jordan was hammering on the door, and Claire said, sarcastically, that her aunt didn't look happy. Just wait until she sees us, Victoria answered. When Jordan yelled out to see if anyone was there, the woman pleaded for assistance, explaining that she had been left inside to die like an animal. When Jordan heard the door being unlocked, she started to give thanks to God. But then she noticed Nikki, who informed her that there wasn't a rescue team. Jordan gave the women the order to leave, but Nikki laughed at the notion that Jordan had any authority in that place. Jordan snarled that Nikki should not push her, but she could take them all. Claire chirped that the three of them could handle Jordan easily, and Jordan made fun of Claire for showing courage all of a sudden. Jordan inquired about the nature of the sick tea party as Nikki motioned for the security to remain outside. As though she'd imagined she could wriggle out, Claire made fun of the fact that Jordan appeared to have broken a nail. Jordan wasn't as smart as Nikki believed she was, and she made a point of saying that being imprisoned against one's will wasn't fun. Jordan questioned whether their only purpose was to boast. Nikki claimed she couldn't imagine a nicer way to spend an afternoon, given the hell Jordan had put them through. Jordan vowed to haunt the Newmans for the rest of their lives, every minute of the day and night. Jordan had always been theatrical, Claire thought, though it didn't seem as powerful as she remembered. Jordan encouraged Nikki to pour herself a long glass of vodka and reassure herself that everything was over when she was by herself. Jordan surmised that Nikki was intoxicated at the time, since she would have needed to be in order to approach him. Jordan had stolen Nikki's sobriety, but she'd regained it in a matter of days, she claimed. Victoria likened it to how Jordan had taken her daughter away, but Claire was back home, with her family. Claire declared that although Jordan had taken her life, she was regaining it with the love of her family, and it was greater than she could have ever imagined. Jordan chastised them for their foolish complaints and fretting over what she had done to them, when in reality, it had been what they had earned. She asked whether they honestly believed that would take care of everything. Jordan was reminded by Nikki of who of them had been foolish enough to be duped into being imprisoned in a basement. Jordan declared that having watched the Newmans for years, time had given her insight, and she had only sorrow and catastrophe in store for them. Jordan implied that Claire remained a hateful person and would attempt to murder them once more, maybe with success. Victoria argued that Jordan's influence was solely to blame for Claire's previous actions. Jordan maintained that Victoria couldn't truly love Claire if Victoria didn't trust her, despite the fact that Jordan had reared and loved Claire. You abused me, snarled Claire. Jordan saw how Claire detested her and cautioned Victoria that Claire might turn on her as well. Nothing Jordan could say or do would make Victoria question her daughter, she huffed. Jordan challenged Victoria to have Claire stay at her house, but Victoria was told to go to bed with one eye open. Jordan screamed that Claire had conned them all by posing as Nikki's trustworthy and capable assistant, and she suggested that Claire was pulling a ruse to trick them into thinking she was Victoria's long-lost daughter. Claire argued that she had changed because she had received support and had come to understand what family and love were. Jordan wondered how much heart Victoria still had, considering that she'd failed to hold onto a relationship or a home. 
Jordan was furious that the only things Victoria had left to cling to were the grandeur and reputation of the Newmans. Nikki yelled, shut up, bitch. Jordan made fun of Nikki, saying she knew she wanted to head to the liquor shop, buy the nicest bottle of vodka, and drink it all up to make it all go away. Declaring that she had withstood Jordan's assault on her sobriety, Nikki further emphasized her superior strength in the abstinence from alcohol by revealing Jordan to be a sad person. Jordan hoped Nikki had shared that happiness with her terrible sponsor, Seth, who had passed away as a result of Nikki. Nikki shot back, saying that Jordan was a serial killer, which was why Seth had died. Since Jordan would have plenty of time to reflect on the image of the three Newman women joined in love and strength while she was incarcerated indefinitely, Nikki hoped that it would haunt Jordan for the rest of her life. Jordan expressed amazement that Nikki wasn't just going to leave her there. Although Nikki stated that she would rather Jordan never left the hellhole she created for himself, knowing that Jordan would deteriorate in her cell was a better alternative. Jordan reaffirmed to Claire that the Newmans could get away with anything because of their name, but all Jordan had done was get revenge on her sister. Jordan thought Claire would become the next black sheep, much like her uncle Adam, but worse because she was part Howard. Claire declared resolutely that she was where she wanted to be and that Jordan could no longer reach her. Jordan hoped Claire was miserable because she gave in to those vipers. Victoria gushed that although Jordan would pass away alone, Claire would be fully loved and embraced by their family. Jordan took a vial out from under the filthy mattress and said, someone is going to die sooner rather than later. Jordan emphasized to them that she held the ultimate authority. The poison in the bottle, Jordan moaned, was more deadly than the one she'd used at the lake house. Jordan moaned that she was tired of the new mum's haughty yapping, believing their money and reputation put them in command. She said that it had been her initial idea to kidnap Nikki and Victor and give it to them there, but she'd moved on to plan B. In response, Nikki said that Jordan was the one with grandiose illusions and that she was making amends for a life that had been worthless. Nikki imagined that in prison, Jordan would be simply another prisoner with a number, and no one would be interested in hearing about her experiences. Jordan laughed heartily and disclosed that the vial was not Nikki's last resort. Jordan declared triumphantly, it's mine, and she downed the vial's contents. She responded, Tata, Claire, and threatened to let them all go to hell. Jordan insisted on finding out if Claire had any parting words for the mother who had loved and given so much for her. Jordan stumbled towards the bed, feeling the effects of the toxin. Nikki countered that they hadn't coerced Jordan into taking the poison or Victoria wondered if they ought to assist. Victoria retorted that Jordan had ingested it in order to evade punishment. Claire wondered if Jordan should have died or lived after everything her aunt had made them go through. So what do you guys think about this update? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like my videos, please press like and subscribe for more. I'll see you guys next time.